lady with the groceries. Oh, I'm not on Emma. How about now? So I'm pastor up yet. Yeah. 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 When we went to pay for those groceries, this happened Thanksgiving weekend. And because of the holiday, uh, the link cards were not going to be filled until Monday. This was on a Saturday. And I heard the lady trying to explain that they really had no food. So when we paid for it, I was kind of shocked when it was a little over $100, but it didn't matter. We were told to do it, so we did it. But a month later, uh, along with all the little blessings we got, about a month later, I received a letter in the mail from a credit card company that we had long paid off, and they had gotten involved in a class action suit over the way they were calculating their interest and stuff. And we were in that suit, didn't know it, and had a check for a little over $400. Oh, God. Oh, so God gave it back. Wow. But the obedience, you know, is really what made it happen. Um, Real quick, like, I want to ask you guys, because I believe in the church family, we can use your prayers. Next Sunday, I'm going to be pastoring at uh, Pastor David Guernsey's church in Austin, Indiana. The week after, Pastor Rob's going to be there. Pastor Bob's been there, so we're, they affectionately called it the Illinois Invasion. So we're going to invade Indiana for the next two weeks. So keep Pastor Rob and I both in your prayers over the next couple of weeks. So we're going to be ministering there. How many people know who Dracula is? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, he's not somebody you want in your head in the early morning hours. Friday night, I went to bed, and I thought, really, that I had a message prepared for today. And I love it when he changes it on me. But I went to bed Friday night about, oh, I don't know, 11.30. Woke up about 12.30, quarter to one, and I'm with Dracula in my dream. And I positioned myself in the role of Renfield, where I can be his manservant, but I can trap him and destroy him. And in the dream, I drove a stake through Dracula's heart, and I woke up. No big deal. Went back to sleep and went back into the dream again. Second scenario is, I tried driving the stake through his heart, but he pulled it out. So I jumped out the window of a castle where there was a hang glider, and I'm hang gliding down a mountain. He turns himself into a bat and lands on the handlebar and just yapping in my face. So I grab this little bat butt, and I must have been hanging around Pastor Rob and Pastor uh, uh, Jeff because I had one of them geek pen pads and I pulled a wooden pencil out and stuck it through his heart. And I went back to sleep. And I go back into the dream. And I wake up the third time, and this time I drove his coffin out in the parking lot where the sun's at, and I opened the lid, and he closed it, so I hit it with a sledgehammer and busted the coffin. And I went back to sleep. And a fourth time. And this time, I'm not messing around. I opened the lid of the coffin out in the sun, the sunlit parking lot, and I threw a hand grenade in there and ran. But this time, it's like 4 o'clock in the morning, and i got to get up at 6.30. So I'm laying there and I'm saying like, okay, Lord, I really need some sleep. What is going on with this dream in Dracula? And not in an audible voice, but in my spirit, I heard him say, son, no matter what form the enemy takes, I am greater than the enemy. Amen. And I said, thank you, Lord, I got my message, and I went to sleep. Dracula, you do not want in your head all night long, believe me. I'm not a big fan of Dracula to begin with. So needless to say, Today's message is God is bigger than your enemies. And in the message, you'll hear me say adversary a lot. When I do, keep in mind that you can make that personal because it can be a person. Pastor Jeff came under attacks from people. It can be an attack through health. It can be an attack through your finances. It can be obstacles. There's still an enemy behind it. Amen. And that's something we've got to understand. The first thing, though, we've got to understand is that, and, and Pastor, I really do not have to put any... any uh, I'm going to paraphrase a lot because there's so much scripture here. Uh, the first thing we have to understand is that he is the master plan of destiny. In Genesis 128, it says, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth on the earth. Over every living thing. How many people know diabetes is a living thing? Cancer is a living thing. 
He said, we have authority over every living thing. And he's the master plan of destiny. I didn't write it, he did. Psalms 115 says, The Lord shall increase you more and more, you and your children. You are blessed of the Lord, which has made heaven and earth. Aaron, you're not just blessed. Your children are blessed. Amen. Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the thoughts I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. I have an expected end. I don't care what happens here. My expected end is when I take my last breath here, I'm going to be in the presence of the Lord for eternity. Amen. Amen. My children are going to be with me in eternity. Amen. My church family, you guys, you're going to have to put up with me up there. Amen. So get used to it now. And, I, and, and I'm sorry, I do not agree with Pastor Rob. I do not believe we're going to be eating cows. He can take that up. He can take that up. With, he can take that up with the master plan of destiny. <laughs> But you know what? While we're here on earth, we are going to uh, we are going to face some challenges. First Corinthians sixteen nine says, "For a great door and effectual is open unto me, and there are many adversaries." Whenever there's a work of the Spirit, um, wherever there's a door open for the gospel, there's going to be adversaries. I mean, you can just almost set your clock by and count on it. It's not uncommon for adversaries of Christ to get excited at the Spirit working. So we shouldn't be surprised when we get attacked just like Paul did. You know, you cannot, you cannot be working effectively and not expect the enemy to come after you. And what, was, what was that saying we had uh, here a couple weeks ago in, in Foundations? Uh, when I go, I want the hmm. uh, I want the devil to anyway. Basically, celebrate. pardon me. Yeah, the devil celebrate, and that's the way we should be. We should be working effectively to where when we leave, the demons in hell celebrate because they get a break. Amen. But you know, Paul never mentioned or considered adversary as a reason to leave Ephesus or his ministry. In fact. He considered that even more reason to stay. He was being effective. He knew it. He knew the people that were there was going to need him to be there. They was going to need encouragement. And as believers in the body of the Christ, I need every one of you to be here. There is power in prayer, corporate prayer, from your brothers and sisters in the body. There's power in your prayer, but you can magnify that when you get a group of you praying. When you're all born again believers. And no believer, especially you ministers, which in this church is about half of them, uh, we should never try to deliberately make enemies of the gospel. We should never, ever, and this is something I'm going to have to learn. One of the biggest things the church has done for years, we made enemies. We've gone out there on the street corner and started condemning everybody. And now we've got enemies. We're in a society today where it, even the people who profess to be Christians don't want to hear the truth. So we don't need to be out there exciting people against the gospel. We need to be out there loving people, sharing the truth with people, telling them what God's done for us. You can get a lot more done instead of trying to tell them what God can do for them. Put yourself in their shoes and say, you know what, I've been there. I've done that. But let me tell you how I got through it and who got me through it. We don't need to excite the enemy. He's going to come at us enough. We don't need any help. Whenever there's the enemies attacking you, consider that that's just evidence that you've got his attention. He knows something's coming. He knows there's a breakthrough. He knows the story. He knows God's bigger than he is. So anytime you're attacked, consider that as evidence that God's on your side. This should be evidence that the Holy Spirit's kindled a fire in your spirit and that you've roused a response from the enemy and he's desperately trying to maintain control over your situation. Spiritual obstacles and attacks should be a time for speaking the word. How many times have we taught that or been taught that in here? When you come up against something, don't do it in yourself. 
speak the word. What did Jesus do when he was tempted? It is written. All through his ministry, it is written. He quoted the word back to him. And we need to do the same thing. When you start speaking the word, you have a better chance of overcoming your obstacle and walking out your victory. The true believer standing in faith can stimulate, can be stimulated by opposition more than being discouraged by it. Opposition can be a motivator. I can prove that. Tell Pastor Rob he can't do something. Tell him he's wrong. You want to see motivation? He will drive himself crazy er, trying to prove that he is right. I love it because when there's something I'm not sure about, I don't understand, I just, I just tell him. Because I know next week he's going to come back with the answer. I don't have to look it up. <laughs> but seriously, opposition could be a motivator. I mean, when you've been told that something's wrong with you physically, that word rises up in you. You're not denying the fact that the medical diagnosis is there, but that word rises up in you. That opposition becomes a motivator to get more in the word, to declare the victory more, and to walk out your victory. A true a, a, a door opening is not only a chance to walk in a victorious life, but it's also a, a chance to spread the gospel. And we need to watch for those opportunities, and we need to open that door, and, and we need to watch for doors that uh, a door of hope. We need to look for a door of faith. We look, need to look for a door of utterance, an open door to effectively do God's work. You know, we may face oppositions when the door is open. They're not always easy. And there's people out there that would love to shut those doors on you. But there's no door that God opens that man can close. So when we start getting the doors open for us to do something, how many feel that God has called you to do something and you kind of been hesitant, but for whatever reason, you didn't feel you were educated enough, you didn't feel you financially could do it. I mean, there's people that are living in defeat all over the country, waiting, instead of taking that step of faith and realizing God opened that door. Well, if he opened that door, he's going to equip you, he's going to empower you to go through that door, if you just trust in him. But you know, the opposition, there's some case studies I want to look at here. Uh, you guys remember a guy named Jeremiah, or Nehemiah, I'm sorry, in the wall of Jerusalem? Oh, let, me, let me paraphrase a little bit here. When they were building the wall, there was these, there, there was these guys, uh, please forgive my pronunciation. There was Sanballat, Tobiah, Gresham, and there were others that were trying to stop the wall from being rebuilt in Jericho. So they came up with an attack against Nehemiah himself. And it was a three-pronged attack. One, they thought they would discredit him or assassinate him. And uh, old Samblatt and Gresham, they invited Nehemiah to meet him out on, to meet out on the plains of Ono. Uno, Ono, you know, whoever it is. <laughs> and on the, on, on the, to look at it, it looked like they were wanting to meet for a little peace agreement. But reality is, uh, Nehemiah suspected something wasn't quite right because this was going to take him on a day's journey away from Jerusalem so he wasn't going to be able to, to oversee hanging these gates and stuff and he also kind of figured that he got out there by himself he was greatly outnumbered so if they were planning something so he sent back a message and he says uh, guys can't do it I'm busy I can't get away so he was not openly accusing them but he was giving them an opportunity, if they were serious, that they can meet him on his grounds. Okay? Sometimes, when we sense in the spirit something's not right, we need to stop. We need to just think about it. And, and you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to pick on Pastor Jeff. I have great respect for him for what he's done. But we all know what happened to him here a few months back. Uh, we've seen it. we heard it. And... I have a lot of respect for him because he was not impulsive. He prayed about it. He asked for our prayers for guidance about it. He stood his ground. And look what happened. Now he's in a much more favorable position. He's got more people supporting him there 
than he had before. But the attack on his character could not be considered credible because everybody knew his reputation. And God defended him. And we were talking about this in foundation class. Sometimes when you get attacked, you really got to listen to what the Spirit's telling you. I went through a situation some years back, and you got to understand, my heritage is Lakota, uh, Lakota Sioux, so I got a little bit of a temper. My first impulse is I will get them. But the Holy Spirit said, shut up. I mean, literally, those words, shut up, shut your mouth. I'll take care of this. I did exactly that. I shut up. I didn't say a word to anybody. There were accusations that was tried to be made, but they never took root. Within a few months, it just died away because nobody would believe it. Now, had I done me in the natural and opened my mouth, you know, years later, I'd probably still be defending myself. So, Nehemiah came under, you know, an attack. They tried to kill him. That didn't work. So they went to slander. And uh, they, they put a little bit of pressure on uh, Nehemiah, trying to get him out to the plain of Ono. And old Sanballat, he sent a servant with an unsealed letter with a rumor in it that Nehemiah was trying to become king of the Jews which they had a king. This could put Nehemiah's life in great danger if the king thought he was trying to be overthrown with this guy. So this, this letter was, was a very dangerous letter because it could have led to the, not just the slander, but the death of Nehemiah, but they painted it in a way to where they appeared to have Nehemiah's best interest at heart that was trying to protect him. How many people know that some of your friends are not your friends? We look out here in that society today, and in that realm, there's no denying that the influence of Christianity has dwindled down tremendously. There's no denying that there are people out there that are so-called Christians, believers, that you need to stay away from. Because they will, if they don't agree with you, you can come under attack. They can try to destroy you. I mean, I, I'm not picking on Pastor Rob, but I'm going to use him for an example. We know his personality. We know he loves to debate. I won't use the word argue, I'll say debate. Amen. We know that he likes to be right. These are not bad characteristics. But we also know that there are people within the church world that could use those two, twist it around against him, and do everything they could to discredit that man and destroy his ministry. Now that's not going to happen because of two reasons. One, I have faith that he knows where he stands and he's not going to let it happen. And I also have faith that if he comes under attack, this whole body is going to be there fighting back against him. But we can be slandered just like Nehemiah. If we're not careful and choose our friends wisely. But after he, uh, after he was slandered like this, he had a bold response that demonstrated his trust in God. He, out, he, he flat out right denied the accusation. He told his fellow workers what the letter was all about. And uh, then he did something that he regularly did. He prayed asking God for strength. How many times when we're, when we're under attack do we stop and just pray and ask for strength? Now, I'm going to tell myself because I'm guilty of this. I'm much better now. For years, I would try to deal with the problem first. And then when it didn't work and I usually made it worse, then I would go ask God for strength and wisdom on how to do it. I have gotten much, much better now thanks to Pastor Debbie and my wife. Because my wife is real quick. When I say something dumb, she'll look up and say, is that your profession? And I thank God for it. Because she does keep me on track. The third scheme that they tried to use against Nehemiah was treachery. Uh, this is where they really went after his credibility. They hired, sure, Shemaiah 
a man on the inside is to propose a solution to Nehemiah, claiming to be a prophet. And he locked himself in a house, supposedly from a disability or a ritual defilement, and then he sent word to Nehemiah. And he tried to get Nehemiah to meet him in the temple. Now, Nehemiah must have known him and trusted him because it would not have been logical to propose this had Nehemiah not known him. But we know the story how he tried to get Nehemiah to meet him in the temple. Now, Nehemiah was smart. First off, he knew that nobody but the priest was allowed to go in the temple. And there's a good chance if he went in there, he wasn't coming out alive. The second thing was, too, is he knew that if he went in that temple and he did come out alive, his credibility was totally destroyed because it would demonstrate that he did not respect God. So that didn't work either. So if Nehemiah can come under these attacks from people, what's to stop us from coming under attacks? And I'm sure nobody here has ever been attacked by another person. You know one of the greatest ways that you can get attacked by people? Your marriage. The enemy loves to get accusations going. I'll tell you a story. This is a true story. This is funny. I got caught. Pictures was taken. I did not know this. Pictures was taken with me and, uh, well, a woman biker. And we were having dinner together in a restaurant, just the two of us. And this person seen us. And uh, he took a picture of me with this woman and sent it to a good friend of ours, or a good friend of hers who happened to be, you know, no. And it was hilarious. And I, and I sent word back, as the next time you want to take a picture of me and my wife, let me know, and I'll just pose for the camera. But we were out riding, and she came in and had a do-rag on her head and everything, and he took a picture thinking I was with another woman. <laughs> That's a true story. This man, by the way, is not really up for the gospel. <laughs> um, but that attack could have been devastating to my marriage had other people, but it, it got close, not to her. The person he sent her to sent her right back and told him, said, you mean, dummy, you might well have to look at that. That's, that's Sue that he's with. If that story had got around, if that story had happened to Rob and got around, well, we'd be visiting Crystal in prison. <laughs> <laughs> Rob has told us repeatedly what would happen if he ever did that. <laughs> But, you know, I can laugh at it instead of getting mad and upset about it. I mean, it was an attack that came at me, that came at our marriage. And I could have really got upset and went after this guy. But thank God I've grown to a point where I just considered the source. And I sent the message back. It's the next time you want to take a picture of me and my wife, let me know. We'll post for the camera. That ended. There was no more attack. There was no more accusation of anything going on because he got caught. Nehemiah also knew that there was two flaws. One of the flaws was already discussed. And uh, the other one is, Nehemiah knew that God was not going to call him to run away from a project that he was that close to finishing. Now, I, this is for everybody in here, but this is really towards people in ministry. My, you know I grew up the son of an assembly God pastor, and I've seen this happen all my life. You know in your heart that God called you to do something and you've been faithfully doing it and you're getting close to the end of seeing victory, it's not going to be uncommon for the enemy to throw things in there to discourage you, fear, whatever. But don't give up because God will never call you away from an assignment until you've completed what he wanted done. Nehemiah knew this. So even the third scheme didn't work. Here's another one. You remember Paul? Remember when Paul got caught or got brought before the high council? I was reading this and it's really kind of funny. I get to paraphrase because you have to read the whole chapter to, to, to know all this. He's standing in front. He's asked to be heard and he's standing in front of the council now. And right off the bat, um, he makes the chief priest Ananias 
madder than a juline hornet. And if you don't know how mad a juline hornet it can get when it's hot and dry, just get close to him. You'll find out real quick. But he told, he told Ananias that he had lived for God all of his life up to that point. This made Ananias mad. And he told his aides to slap Paul's face. Now, Paul could have got offended right there, but he didn't. He just stood there and says, he actually called him fake. He says, you're telling, you're going to violate God's law because you're telling him to slap my face, which goes against the very law you're accusing me of. And then he did something even bolder. He says, go ahead, slap my face, and God's going to knock you down. Now, they weren't mad, they honestly weren't mad enough before. They're really mad now. He's done it. He's got them all yelling. And one of them looked up at me and asked Paul, said, how dare you talk to the chief priest that way? What well, kind of surprised Paul? And he looked up and he goes, well, how am I supposed to know? Because he's showing sure acting like a chief priest. But then he did a remarkable thing. He paused and he says, but you're right. The law says we're not supposed to speak against our leaders. I'm sorry. I apologize. But it's not done yet. Um, he knew the council was made up of Sadducees and Pharisees. And I can see myself in this. A little honoriness. He decided to exploit that. You know, Sadducees and Pharisees really did not like each other. And he told them, he says, you know, I've been a Pharisee from a long line of Pharisees. And it's because of my Pharisee convictions and resurrection of the dead that I've been hauled into court. And that's when the, the council just kind of split down the middle. And now they're all yelling and screaming at each other until finally, see, the Sadducees do not believe in the resurrection of the angels or spirits. The Pharisees, they, they believe in everything. So this really created a huge quarrel. And one of the Pharisees uh, finally shouted down the other side and he said, you know, what do we do if this is a a wrong spirit. Or, or what do we do if we're wrong this is a spirit that's spoken to him or an angel? What if we're turning out to fight against God himself? And that really blew the thing up. I mean, the fire, that kindled the fire. So bad that the chief guard decided to get Paul out of there before they ripped Paul apart. Okay, so Paul's being attacked now, but now God's stepping in and starting to defend him. He's getting him out of that situation. And that night... Uh, they escorted him back to safety, and that night, the master came to Paul and said, it's going to be all right. He says, everything's going to turn out for the good. You, you've been good, a good witness for me here in Jerusalem, and you're going to be a witness in, in uh, Rome. But there was a plot being formed. There was 40 that got together, and they made this vow that they would not eat until they had killed Paul. I don't know about you, but I don't make a vow. It's not going to involve not eating. That's one of my favorite pastimes. I kind of like that, you know. But these 40 not only made this vow, they went to the council and said, hey, we made this vow that we're not going to eat anything until Paul's dead. So here's what we need you to do. Send a message to your guard to bring Paul back to the council so that you can question him some more. And we'll take care of it. We'll kill him before he gets here. You won't have nothing to do with it. You won't be responsible. What they didn't know was Paul's nephew was standing there hearing this. So again, protection is coming against Paul. He goes and tells the captain of the guard, and he says, there's 40 men, and they're going to try to kill Paul, and this is how they're going to do it. The captain looks up, and he goes, go get me 200 soldiers. And then, then get me, I believe it was, uh, uh, yeah, 200 soldiers and 200 light infantry and some mules to carry Paul and, his, and his, all of his personal belongings. So we're going to take this man to safety. Now, how you like them odds? you got 40 people trying to kill you. Now you got 400 trying to save your life. Isn't God great? When he comes at you with one thing, you've got a host of angels on the back side over here just watching and saying, okay, we got this. God is greater than anything your enemies can come up with. And you know what? The captain not only um, protected Paul, he wrote a letter to the governor and sent it with Paul, and Paul gets to the governor, and the government takes Paul's case 
and puts Paul in protection. All of Paul's enemies, God was bigger than any of them. He's now literally got the Roman government protecting him. God is awesome. When we stop to think about who we serve, God is awesome. One more. Remember Peter? When Peter's under heavy guard in the uh, in the 12th chapter of Acts, you don't have to go there, but King Herod got in his head that he'd go after some church members, so he murdered James, John's, John's brother, and uh, when he saw how much he rose his popularity, he arrested Paul, had him thrown in jail, and put four squads of soldiers around him. He's under heavy guard. He's actually got two soldiers, or two, yeah, two soldiers chained each other. But what happened? Even though they think they got him in the midnight hour, there's an angel appears. Kind of stuns Paul. If you, I mean, Peter, I'm sorry. If you read this, actually, Peter first thought it was a dream. The shackles fall off of his arms. The angel looks at him and he says, Hey, grab your coat, grab your stuff, and let's get out of here, dude. I'm paraphrasing that. That's, called, that's the book of Job. <laughs> but really, I mean, think about that. They've got him chained to two guards. Now the guards don't wake up. The shackles fall off, the door opens up, and the angel says, come on, we're out of here. We've had enough of this. God is greater than your enemies. You know, you're going to get out of here early today. Uh, no matter what comes at you. And we have, we have seen in, in the four, five years, whatever it's been, I've been associated here. We have seen different things come against people in this body. And yet time and time again, we've seen God turn it around. Kim was talking this morning, and I hope she doesn't get mad. I'm going to share a little bit of her, her, her story. She was talking about when she was trying to open her shop. And there was an attack because there was delays with, with some of the contractors. They kept not getting there to get the work done like they should. So in the meantime, she gets fired. She loses her job because there's a perceived threat that when she leaves, she's going to take customers with her. Now, if you know anybody about anybody that owns, you know, hair shops where they cut your hair and stuff, that's a big no-no. But there was a perceived threat that that was going to happen. So now Kim loses her job. She's single, trying to open her shop, no income coming in. And yet, she never missed a payment. She got the shop open. That was 11 years ago. The shop's still going. God is greater than your enemies. We've heard Dina's testimony when she opened the bakery. That took some faith in God because I'm pretty certain nurses get paid per to good. So to walk in and say, okay, I'm giving up nursing. I'm going to go open the bakery. She probably had a lot of people going, are you crazy girl? I mean, I would have been when I'm going, I hope you know what you're doing. But God's bigger than the enemies. There's also some solemn promises in the Bible. Deuteronomy, I can't say that word, Deuteronomy, chapter 7, verse 8 and 9. He did it out of sheer love, keeping the promise he made to his ancestors. God stepped in and mightily bought, bought you back out of this world of slavery, freed you from the iron grip of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Know this, God is your God, is God indeed. A God you can depend upon. He keeps his covenant of loyal love with those who love him and observe his commandments for a thousand generations. That was out of the Message Bible, by the way. But I love the last line. He keeps his covenant of loyal love with those who love him and observe his commandments for a thousand generations. Have we had a thousand generations yet? I don't think so. Might have had a few hundred, but I don't think we've had a thousand generations. It was brought up this morning in the foundation. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And all this will be added to you. 
How do you seek ye first the kingdom of God? You stay in love with Him. You stay in covenant with Him. You spend time in fellowship with Him. I, I seen a, a comment the other day, and, and you know what? Facebook, social media can be one of the biggest attacks that will ever come against you. There is a Christian organization out there, and they post things daily. And some of the stuff is good, but some of it, you gotta really pay attention to what you're reading anymore. And one of the articles that they read the other day was some of the things that a that pastors need to stop doing, or church believers need to stop doing. And that is telling people that prayer works. Why would I want to start telling you prayer doesn't work? I'm living an example that prayer does work. Five years cancer free. My wife delivered from lupus. The doctors told me she'd be in a wheelchair within five years. It's been almost 20 years. She so look like she's in a wheelchair. She's sitting on a padded seat right now. But we know why. You don't fall off of a motorcycle and not be a little sore. But God protector is there. So why would I go tell people that prayer doesn't work? We're still believing in prayer that, that Dan's going to get into the cop shop. Everybody's calling him Lieutenant Dan. I call him Barney Fife. <laughs> Personal joke that him and I came up with. It's not a bad thing. But attacks can come from many directions. You can read it. Now, I will give you this in fairness. When I read the article, I don't agree with it 100%. But it wasn't as blatant as stop telling people prayer don't work. It, it stopped telling people prayer don't work and teach them how to pray so that it does work. But how many people read that and went, okay, because this is supposed to be addressed to church leaders. There's been other articles in there that, that books, how many times you pick up a book that you thought was a really good book and started reading it and get part way in it and find out, well, wait a minute, something's not quite right here. You're feeding your mind feeding your soul, and you're feeding an attack. That's one thing I've learned around here. Be careful what you say, be careful what you read. Because if you don't, you can mess yourself up if Pastor Deb don't get to you first. Another promise that's in the Bible. Psalms 68, 1 through 3. Let God arise, let his enemies be scattered, let them also that hate him flee from him. A smoke is driven away, so drive them away as wax melted before the fire. So let the wicked perish in the presence of God. But let the righteous be glad. Let them re rejoice before God. Yea, let them exceedingly rejoice. Why wouldn't we rejoice? Because the enemies can be scattered. You know, I I'm going back. In, in the great foundation of the class just starts falling in line with what it's going to be taught out here. And one of the things that was taught about this morning was sowing seed. We're not talking about money now. We're talking about following the leading of the Holy Spirit, being obedient, and sowing the seed that he tells you to see. Several years ago, uh, and I didn't really even know that much about seed at that time, we were having a problem uh, with my daughter. And there was an element in the schools that were trying to pull her in. And it was an element that she didn't need to be running around with. It, it was the, let's say the less than interested in school kids. They were more interested in partying and booze and drugs and all this stuff. And it was really, I mean, we were spending a lot of time praying and we were not getting anywhere. And there was a, 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 a visiting minister in the church at the time and right in the middle of her message, she stopped and she looked up and she says, there's people here that's having some serious battles involving their children. It turned out there was three of us. And she walked up to me and she says, you know, praying for your, 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 your child's fine. But spend time praying for their child. And she went over and said, you pray for theirs. You pray for John and Sue's. We did that. All three couples began to seriously pray for the other children. Within six months, my daughter is away from that element. 
doing good in school, got her life straight. Another one of the ladies, her daughter is in Decatur. They had just opened up King Challenge, getting her life straightened out. The third child, the young man, four years later, as a minister, he preached his mother's funeral. Because we were obedient and sowed seed into somebody else's life. They were praying for our daughter, and that was recognized, and we all received our victory. There is power. When the enemy comes at us, there is power. We do a prayer chain. I personally hate prayer chains. Because 98% of the people see the prayer chain when they get it, and they're busy, and they don't have to pray. I've gotten away from it. I used to be the same way. I don't care if I'm in the middle of Walmart, and you send me a message and say, hey, i got a problem. I'm going to pray. Because that's the corporate family that we should be. There is power in praying for one another. The enemies can be scattered when we join together as a body. Now, uh, I'm going to close with this, maybe. Don't be naive. God will open doors. But watch out. Because when those doors open, you're getting ready to do something for God, there's going to be a lot of adversaries out there. There's going to be times, I know I have, there's times when I've actually wondered if I would have been better off left that door closed. Ultimately, I got the victory. But when that door first opened, I'm like, I'm doing a Gary Coleman looking at God going, what are you, you talking about, Lord? I've been in a situation, I did not ever plan, I... Word of truth, that's my wife. I told somebody probably 25 years ago when they said something about preaching, I said, no, that ain't ever going to happen. I said, that's my dad's thing. I said, I grew up a minister's kid. I know what they go through. There is no way that this boy is ever going to preach. It is not happening. And they looked up and said, be careful. God will have you do the very thing you don't want to do. I don't care. It's not going to happen. Fifteen years later, he sat in the balcony videotaping the first message I did and crying. And I wanted to look up somebody and say, will you just shut up? <laughs> this is not what I wanted to do. I never had a desire to really do this, even though I knew at 13 years old I was going to, but I wouldn't need. My wife was told many years ago when she was a kid, the Holy Spirit told her she was going to be married to a minister. She didn't know she had to marry the devil first, <laughs> get him converted. <laughs> But she was told as a child she was going to be married to a minister. Pastor Deb kept telling some honorary son of hers he was a mighty man of God. Look at the opportunities Pastor Rob has had. He has stood in Washington, D.C., a monument in front of congressmen, senators, and effectively and boldly spoke the word of God. You may not want to do what God calls you to do when that door is open. You may get attacked, but God is bigger than any enemy you will ever face. It's not a sign to retreat. It's a road sign that you're on the right track. It's not a time to back off. I think sometimes when we get doors open and that opposition comes, all right, let me rephrase that. I think there's times when we want a door open. And we might get a little frustrated because God don't open that door in our time when we want it open. But he has a reason. And I think one of those reasons is there's times that he delays opening doors that we want because he knows we're not ready for the opposition on the other side. I assure you, and Pastor Bob told you the same thing, 30 years ago, he was not as effective as he is today. Ten years ago, Pastor Rob was not as effective as he is today. Maybe for the enemy, but not here. God will open the door in his time. Be patient. <coughs> so, and I'm going to close with this. I really am. Saul felt that Goliath was too big to hit. David thought he was too big to miss. 
that changes some attitude, doesn't it? There's going to be doors open that you're going to look at it and think, man, I, there's no way I can do that, Lord. When you need to be saying, is that all you want me to do, Lord? Be honest. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I know I'm going to do it because you're equipping me to do it. It might look like Goliath now, but that's just a target too big to miss. So I'm going to go forward. I'm going to understand that the enemies are no match for you. I'm going to expect the door open. I'm going to walk in. I'm going to have my finger ready to pull the trigger when the enemy comes. I got a gun of the word. The room might be occupied. I might have to drive the opponents out before I get to enjoy the room. But I know one thing, and Rob Falk said it this morning. I got a Jesus survivor kit. Amen. God is bigger than your enemies. Did you get anything out of this? Amen. Robbie, you got anything you want to say? Uh, word, well, half of us will be headed to Kentucky next weekend. Keep us in your prayers as we travel and stuff. Uh, remember, next week, Pastor Jeff? I'm not going to be here, but y'all coming. Y'all come now. Yeah. The week after, we got Pastor Vince who's going to be here for to minister and stuff. So, God love you. Have a great week. And remember, whatever you're facing, God is bigger. Amen. Amen.